Delta Charlie, airport advisor. North American 280 Delta Charlie. Winds are out of the south southeast, 5 to 10 miles per hour, favoring runway 12. And altimeter is 29 or 9 or 4. 9 or 4. Clock flight check. 2, 3, 4. Okay, Cox, uh, Stiffel is using runway uh, 12, left traffic, uh, 1735 is closed. Winds are uh, southeast at 5, altimeter is 2994. Cod flight, let's go, Thermal Unicom, 123, point zero. Two, three, four. Cod flight check. Two, three, four. Uh, Thermal, uh, North American 280, Delta, Charlie, flight of 4, G28, taxi. Airborne again. Nowhere does freedom of spirit have more meaning. All who fly are special people. Confident, capable, and accomplished. Formation flying demands these traits. Precise formation flight is an art. All your advanced aviator skills must be further developed and honed to exacting tolerances. As a wingman in formation, you must be able to control your aircraft's position relative to your leader's aircraft within a few feet. During formation flight, your performance is based on one simple criteria. You are either in formation or out of formation. There is no in-between. Your aircraft position as wingman will be defined by precise angles and distances from your leader's aircraft to be judged correct. To maintain position within these very narrow margins will require your utmost concentration and the highest level of aviation skill. This is the subject of this film. Using the classroom, video training aids and airborne sequences from the wingman's viewpoint, you will be led through a basic formation flying course. Follow us through this informative and entertaining course.
Using the supplied video table of contents and formation flying manual, you can structure your viewing conveniently. The film format is simple and straightforward. Each maneuver is covered by three sequences, classroom first, airborne views second, and finally a question and answer review period. The classroom portion covers basics, the mechanics, techniques and execution of the maneuvers. Without the foundation knowledge and concept phase presented in class, the actual formation flying sequences would lose definition. The maneuvers are covered in a logical building block sequence beginning with the basics of the two-ship formation. The two-ship, known as a section, requires the wingman to master station keeping and position change skills as directed by his leader. Smooth, slow, and deliberate aircraft control is a skill worn as a merit badge by the accomplished wingman. A safe and proficient wingman will match his leader's aircraft movements precisely and with finesse. When performed correctly, formation flight is graceful and rewarding. During the in-flight segment of our film, Former military fighter pilots and highly skilled civilian formation pilots will demonstrate the fine art of formation flying viewed from the pilot's perspective. Our classroom instructor is John Harrison, an Air Force fighter pilot veteran and Delta Airlines pilot with over 18,000 hours of flight time. Join us now in the classroom for the definitive look at formation flying, the art. Well, good afternoon and welcome to uh, the Darton International Formation Training Film. Um, this is a, uh, an attempt to introduce uh, formation training to the uh, civilian world and we hope we fill a gap that uh, has not existed before. Uh, the military, in the past, the military was the only frame of reference for getting formation training, but uh, uh, now uh, with the increased activity and with warbird airplanes and uh, formation aerobatic acts and so on, uh, there's a real need for formation training uh, in the, uh, for the civilian. And it's hoped that this film will give you a, an introduction to basic uh, formation flying, to the art of formation flying, if you will, and uh, will help you uh, both with the basics and uh, lead you into an advanced course of, of formation flying. Uh, what we're going to attempt to do is uh, give you some of the basic definitions, uh, a little background about formation, some of the terms and, uh, and uh, processes that you're going to have to deal with to be qualified in formation, explain some of the maneuvers on the board, and then through the, uh, uh, the wonder, really, of videotape, show you uh, some formation flying that will
give you the view both from the wingman's point of view and from the lead's point of view of all the various maneuvers uh, that you will need to know to be a safe and, and a comfortable formation pilot. A little background, uh, the formation flying is, is it's a dangerous uh, environment. A lot can happen. You're flying high performance or maybe not so high performance airplanes in close proximity. And there is no position or no place for um, undisciplined flying. Uh, everyone has to uh, go and move to the same drummer, to the same beat. And so uh, you have to have standard signals, standard procedures, standard briefings, and so on to do this safely. What's happened over the years is that um, initially when the Warbird movement started uh, booming in the uh, 70s, uh, more and more civilians bought Warbird aircraft, and of course one of the big things in Warbird flying is flying in formation. Oshkosh was probably the impetus for a lot of this. The mass uh, uh, plane uh, shows that you see at Oshkosh, the Warbird show, that on some days may involve as many as 200 aircraft. Mass flights that we've had of uh, 50 or more T-6s or T-34s uh, show that there's a real interest in uh, formation flying uh, with Warbird aircraft. There's a real need for good training, but where do you go to get this training? There is no civilian protocol for formation flying. As a result of that, over the years, many of the uh, civilian, uh, particularly the civilian Warbird uh, uh, groups, uh, Valiant Air Command, Confederate Air Force, Warbirds of America, EAA, Warbirds of America, and so on, T-34 Association, had put together various formation training manuals that uh, attempted to uh, uh, set up a protocol for civilian formation flying. And many of these manuals were written by maybe ex-Army or Navy or Marine or Air Force pilots. They were all different, and we uh, created a, a Tower of Babel that uh, each group was using different hand signals, uh, different procedures. And if there's anything in formation that's important, it's standardization. Everyone must understand the hand signals uh, and the procedures and so on. And to safely fly with any other wingman or any other lead, uh, there has to be a, a firm understanding, disciplined way of doing it. As a result of that, and a result of all of these different manuals being written, uh, the T-34 Association took the lead and published a formation training manual. This happens to be the third edition. Uh, but their first manual was attempt to uh, codify uh, civilian formation flying based on uh, military background. As a result, they took some of the best of the hand signals of, that the uh, Air Force had, that the Navy had, and compiled them and standardized uh, for the T-34 Association. And they did a wonderful job of it. Now, this manual alone will not teach you everything you need to know about formation. But it will give you standardized hand signals. It will tell you about the background of formation training, uh, show you some of the visual sight pictures, and um, talk about the discipline of formation flying. Well, the Warbirds of America, EAA Warbirds of America, and the North American Trainer Association took this one step further. Uh, they decided that they would adopt this manual as the standard manual for the EAA Warbirds of America and hopefully for all Warbird aircraft in the United States. And they have been very successful with this program. It's uh, caught on. Um, most of the uh, groups in the country are now standardized around this manual so that uh, uh, whether you're flying a T-6 or a T-34 or a P-51 or a T-28, you now have a standard protocol that you can use. Your training video that you're looking at today uh, relies heavily on this manual and you've received a copy of this book uh, with your training video along with a formation uh, flight briefing guide. Uh, and both of these publications will be used and referred to uh, throughout this course. Um, this manual, if you need further copies, uh, can be obtained through the EA Warbirds of America and uh, uh, through their office at Oshkosh or through the T-34 Association. Now, as I said, it was taken one step further. Uh, one of the things that you get into in formation flying is that it's very difficult, particularly for the novice, to fly formation into similar airplanes. You can do that, but it's not advised. And uh, it was found that uh, big engine and small engine T-34s, while they could fly together, it was a big push for the guys with the small engines and required lower power, much lower power settings than they would like for the big engine 34s. And the same thing happened with the uh, A model T28s and the B and C model 28s with the higher horsepower engines. Uh, there's a big mismatch in weight, acceleration, inertia, and what have you. And we would highly recommend that if you're going to get involved in formation training that uh, you fly similar aircraft. Not that you can't fly a, a P-51 can fly off the wing of a B-25 all day long, but in the interest of formation training, it's nice to have matched aircraft. As a result of this, uh, the different groups within the Warbirds uh, came up with a patch program. And the T-34 Association handles the formation qualifying for all the T-34 pilots. Uh, the North American Trainer Association, NADA, uh, handles the certification and qualification of T-6 and T-28 pilots. 
and the P-51 pilots have their own group uh, within the EA Warbirds of America to qualify P-51 uh, pilots. And if you're qualified to fly in formation in a T-6, this is not necessarily recognized by, recognized by the uh, T-28 or the 51 pilots. Each group requires that you take a check ride in their particular type of airplane. Uh, the patch that I'm wearing here on my sleeve is the uh, T-28 formation patch, and this is given by the North American Trainer Association in conjunction with EAA that shows that uh, I'm a qualified T-28 wingman. And the 34s, the T-6s, and the 51s each have their own distinctive patch. If you become a flight leader, qualified as a flight leader, then you get a leader patch that goes with it that lets the group know that you've demonstrated the qualities necessary to be a flight lead, to lead a flight. So that's the patch program that we have. How do you get qualified? Um, in the back of this manual is, the, uh, is not only a briefing guide, but also the, uh, the checklist that uh, will be utilized on your check ride. The uh, 34 Association, NADA, uh, both maintain check pilots around the country uh, that are qualified to give you a check ride as a wingman, as a flight leader. And when you've reached a level of proficiency in formation training and you contact a representative of one of these groups, they'll set you up with a check pilot, you take a check ride, you qualify, you get your patch. What does the patch qualify you for? Well, uh, it was decided in the interest of safety that uh, if you were going to fly in an air show sponsored by the Experimental Aircraft Association, and that would be Oshkosh or Sun and Fun, that if you were going to fly in that show in a formation, you can fly solo, but if you're going to be part of a formation, you must be formation qualified, have the appropriate patch. And not only must you have the appropriate patch, but you must be current. In other words, you must have flown formation within the last two years be signed off by a flight leader. So we maintain currency uh, um, records on our pilots and who's formation qualified, who's qualified as a leader, who's qualified as a wingman. Uh, and the program has been very successful. Uh, it's provided uh, some standardization. We think it's greatly enhanced safety. But the one thing the program can't do and hasn't done is that uh, obviously due to the liability and the cost, neither of these groups, the Experimental Aircraft Association, 34 Association, or the North American Trainer, can provide training pilots or instruction. Uh, and there are no, uh, as far as I know, there are no formation training schools in the country other than the military. So how do I get formation qualified? Well, this is the intent of this film, to help you get started, to let you know what formation is all about. And whether you're flying in uh, Comanches or Cherokees or Stearmans or T6s, the basics of formation are all the same. It doesn't matter what plane we're using in the diagram or what speeds we're talking about. All the principles are the same. Um, and we hope through this to give you uh, the basics that you need. And from here, then you'll need to find yourself a qualified formation instructor who's qualified in your airplane that can teach you uh, the basics. And then hopefully, once you're uh, up to speed and qualified, you will contact one of these organizations to give you the check ride. Before we can uh, really discuss the mechanics of formation, which is what our video is all about, it's first uh, we think it's necessary that you understand a little about the theory and history of formation flying to get you in the right frame of mind. The only frame of reference that exists for formation flying is the military. This is what it was developed for. There's a very specific need for formation. You're seeing on the video here many examples of formation flying. And formation, uh, uh, whether it's in helicopters or transports, or involves aerial refueling between bombers and, uh, and tankers or fighters and tankers, whether it involves uh, mutual support in combat, one fighter supporting another. Almost everything that a military would do in Desert Storm was a, was a, a great example of formation and formation tactics. Everything involved some form of formation. And, and there's only a military protocol for that. There is, no, there is nothing in your civilian training or in your civilian background that prepares you for formation flying. So I'd like to put one thing to bed. One of the things that we found in giving lectures at Oshkosh and talking about formation is that sometimes there was some resentment by civilian trained pilots of the military trained pilot. And they'd uh, say, well, you guys flew uh, you know, fighters in the military, so you think you're red hot. And uh, you know, we don't need this. Uh, you know, just because you flew, flew a fighter doesn't make you a great formation pilot, whatever. There's no room for this in formation flying. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the only place that most people learned these skills were in the military. And, uh, so it's with hope 
we would hope that civilian people or civilian pilots would accept this, understand that this is the frame of reference and, and where it comes from. Uh, one of the hardest things uh, to communicate in formation, and it's probably 80% of formation is formation discipline. 10%, uh, 10 to 20% is skill. But the majority of it is discipline. And what you find are that pilots are typically, and, and the people who own a lot of the high performance airplanes that we're referring to here, are type A personalities. They're successful, they're strong personalities, they're used to leading. The hardest thing to learn about formation is that you start as a number four man in a formation. You start as a nugget or in the squadron in the military. You were the least experienced pilot. It's pretty hard to take a, a, a pilot who's 45 or 50 years old, runs his own company and he's successful, comes out and wants to fly formation and he's used to being a leader. He doesn't want to be told what to do. He's in charge. Well, all of a sudden now he's back to being a first lieutenant or a second lieutenant. And uh, you go out and you do something in formation, all of a sudden this guy's off doing his own thing. Can't have that. In formation, you have to have absolute discipline. And uh, there's a structure to military formation flying. It's, an, it's uh, evident in the makeup of a flight. What we have here on the board is, a, is an example of a fingertip formation. Got its name from finger four. Looks like the fingers on your hand. Uh, just as a way of a definition, this is finger four, strong right. But a flight is made up of a flight leader. This is the most experienced man. And we're going to talk a lot about this guy. To lead a flight, this is not the guy that can't fly formation, so you put him in the lead. This is the most experienced man. This is the one that should have flown formation the most, who has the most experience, is your most quality pilot. He has a wingman. This is a number two man in the flight. He's a, he's a student, not a student, but an experienced student, if you will. He's the wingman, the number two position in the flight. The number three position in flight is the deputy flight leader or element leader. He's the second most qualified man in the flight. And on his wing, he has number four or the least qualified in the flight, the nugget, the new guy. So you work your way up through the flight from a wingman, either two or four, working your way up to an element leader, number three or deputy flight leader, and then to the flight leader. And this had direct bearing to uh, uh, the makeup of flights and squadrons and, and uh, and wings and so on in the Air Force was based on uh, the basic formation. So uh, there is a very definite military flavor to formation flying and the discipline is the key. Uh, point I'd like to bring across is that, um, well, why do we fly formation? Well, uh, the military did it again for mutual support. Now do we need mutual support? We're not going to war in uh, civilian airplanes, no one's shooting at us, but it's sure nice to go with your buddies off somewhere on a cross country trip in formation. There's a nice discipline, a nice rhythm to it. We like to fly together at air shows, but uh, we don't have any of the tactical a uh, application that the military uh, uh, had in formation flying. But mutual protection, yeah, that is important. We're flying old military airplanes, and it's nice to have a wingman, another pair of eyes with you, to scan for traffic, to point out that uh, your engine is smoking or leaking oil, or if you have radio failure, somebody, a deputy flight leader who can take over and lead you back to your field. Your nav radio fails, element leader takes over and does the navigating for the flight. So there is definite mutual support, and anyone that's been around warbirds for any length of time will have probably been involved in some emergency situations where it's kind of nice to have a wingman. Maybe you're going to have to make a forced landing. Got a wingman that can fly cover over you, call for a rescue. Uh, maybe your airspeed indicator goes out, and you shoot a formation landing off a leader whose airspeed is good, and so you just fly off him and make a formation landing. There are many uh, times that uh, mutual support will prove itself uh, uh, handy in uh, formation flying. So there is a civilian uh, application for this. But the main thing probably will be involved in going to and from air shows. And, uh, and of course you're seeing many examples of air show uh, formation flying. There's a lot more civilian uh, aerobatic teams. Half a dozen years ago you'd see one or two. Now there's uh, do literally probably dozens of civilian formation aerobatic teams. Uh, there's a lot of interest in this kind of flying. Uh, a big point to make that I'd like to stress again is the responsibility of the lead aircraft. We've got a couple FARs that are at play here. Uh, there are very few federal regulations that apply to formation flying, but there's a reference to it on page 8 in your formation training manual. When you're in a formation, you're considered as one airplane for air traffic control purposes, for FAA purposes. This is considered one aircraft. If you have a transponder, the lead aircraft is the one that squawks. Um, he does all the talking for the flight. He scans for traffic for the flight. He's in charge of the flight. He's responsible for it. One of the things that you want to watch, uh, and one of the safety valves we have in formation flying, uh, is flying with people you're familiar with. And we're big on this. When you go to Oshkosh, when you go in any big air show, you don't want to fly with people that you don't know. You want to fly with qualified people who have gone through the formation training program. 
but you also want to fly with your buddies that you fly with all year, that you're comfortable with flying with, that you know your abilities. And it's incumbent upon the lead to know the abilities of all the people in his flight. If this man is a weak uh, wingman, he needs to know that. He needs to conduct his flight accordingly. He has to fly to the skills of the weakest man uh, in the flight. Now, one of the things you're going to hear, and I bet you've all heard it if you've gone to air shows, you'll fly along and you'll say, well, let's see, we got four guys here, we don't know each other, we, we do a rapid introduction. And I'll say, well, uh, gee, Larry, have you flown formation? You say, yeah, I've flown a little bit. And uh, uh, Brian says, yeah, I've flown a little uh, formation too. And say, okay, you can do it, but uh, we got Al here, and Al's never flown in formation. We say, well, gee, let's put Al in the lead then, because he's never flown. He can't fly the wing, so let's put him in the lead. And I call that putting the dummy in the lead. Don't ever, if that ever happens to you, don't walk, run away from that briefing. Don't ever fly with a formation that's being led by an inexperienced formation pilot, because this is the guy that can get you in trouble, unless he knows all of the things that go on in a flight. You can't be a good flight leader unless you've first been a good wingman. So this has, all has to do with the discipline and, and uh, uh, the background that it takes the mental process it takes to make a good formation pilot. All right, before we can want to in, go out and engage in formation flying, we think we should first talk about some of the safety equipment that we feel is uh, essential and, and uh, proper and necessary before you engage in formation flying. Uh, the EA Warbirds of America, NADA, North American Trainer, and T-34 Association are very much interested in flying safety. We also have specific requirements before one of our check pilots will fly with you or get in an airplane with you and engage in any type of formation check ride or training, uh, we require that a certain essential safety equipment are in the airplane. If it's not, our pilots aren't going to fly with you. First thing we recommend strongly is that all pilots that are engaged in any kind of warbird or aerobatic or formation uh, activity wear a helmet. You never know when uh, something may happen, whether it's a bird through the windscreen or a midair or something, that you're going to want some protection for your head. Um, so we think it's very important that you wear a helmet. We also think that you should be wearing a Nomex flight suit like I'm wearing and the, the Nomex flight gloves. Uh, also, and of course that's optional, that's up to you. If I fly with an airplane, I'm going to wear the appropriate safety gear. If you want to fly in uh, shorts and cutoffs and, uh, and uh, uh, silk shirts or nylon shirts that'll burn uh, if you ever have a fire, that's your choice. But uh, I think you're going to find the people that understand formation and the hazards involved will have no question about wearing the appropriate safety equipment. We also recommend fire extinguishers in all the aircraft uh, as appropriate. Uh, we won't fly a formation where we allow anyone in our formations without parachutes. Uh, absolutely, that's probably the most important piece of safety equipment that you can wear. You have to remember that when you're flying in formation, the one potential, one of the biggest potential hazards you have is a midair. If you have a midair, uh, you may have structural failure following that. You may lose a wing. Maybe you'll just bump wings and uh, bend some sheet metal. But, uh, you may lose control of your airplane and your only way out is going to be through a parachute. So we absolutely, positively, will not fly with you or fly in, uh, or let anyone fly in our formations unless they're wearing a parachute. That's absolutely essential. Uh, in Warbird circles last year, there were two successful bailouts from uh, Warbird aircraft. Uh, they didn't involve uh, uh, anything to do with formation, but one was a fire and explosion and uh, another was an engine failure and both, uh, both were successful. So there's a good argument for wearing uh, uh, parachutes in this type of airplane. Um, currency. Uh, we think that uh, uh, in the, our formation program, we require that you fly formation at least once. A, uh, actually, it's a very lenient. I believe it's every two years uh, you have to show a currency that you've flown in some formation. That would be minimum. If you're, and, and we keep records. The EA and Warbirds of America keep records uh, submitted by the different flight leaders that the various wingmen have uh, flown formation within 
the past year or two years. Obviously, if you're going to do something as demanding as formation, you should be doing this once a month, maybe minimum, more than that. In the military, that's all you did every day. This is a fragile skill, uh, and you must practice it and practice it a lot. This is not a skill that you can learn overnight or in a long weekend. It takes many, many hours and, and, and no great expense to uh, get the requirements or get to the level of skill to be a good formation pilot. Goes without saying that uh, your airplane should be well maintained when you're out there in a flight of four or a flight of two. Uh, you know, a chain is only as good as its weakest link. If you have a guy who has a poorly maintained airplane, whose radio doesn't work properly, uh, who is always having to abort for some mechanical problem or another, he just acts as a brake on the flight. Likewise, it's not fair to ask the, uh, the uh, check pilots that the EAA provides uh, to climb into an airplane, and it's totally their option. If I was called out for a check ride, I'd never met you before. I knew nothing about your level of skill. Your airplane looked poorly maintained. Uh, the interphone didn't work. I'm not going to fly with you. I don't have to fly with you. All our check pilots are volunteers, and they require a well-maintained airplane flown by a competent pilot. Would require some sort of endorsement. If a stranger came to me that I know nothing about, I would like to see some sign off in his logbook that uh, he had received some sort of formation training before I would get in, a, in an airplane with him and go off and fly formation, because I'm really hanging it out when I do it. Another thing that we require for any formation check ride is that, and uh, we won't fly in formation with somebody that doesn't have it, is a good operating two-way radio and, a, and an independent interphone. You have to be able to talk on the interphone between the two pilots to give a check ride. You also have to be able to communicate with the other members in the flight. So you must have a good VHF radio and you must have a good interphone uh, to engage in our formation events. Uh, the last thing to mention, and it's a new requirement, uh, there are a few FARs, as we mentioned earlier, that have anything to do with formation flying. All they specify that the lead is in charge and the flight must be pre-briefed. The other requirement that's come out, there's a new FAA directive or um, a letter that deals with experimental airplanes over 800 horsepower, surplus airplanes, turbojet airplanes. It's 87001. It came out in 1991, I think, in February. This will require for people flying these type of airplanes, which would include the T-28s, um, that... Um, that they uh, uh, require on their letter of authorization that they need to fly these airplanes, they need to demonstrate proficiency in formation, also in uh, instrument flying and aerobatics, if they don't want those restrictions on their letter. So I would just like to make those of you who are aware who are flying planes over 800 horsepower experimental and are going to be involved in formation, the newest FAA directive, 87001, will require that you demonstrate your formation skills or no formation will be written on your letter of authorization. Before we can go fly, we've uh, talked about personal equipment and uh, some of the history and background of formation flying. Now we have to uh, fly, and formation flying has its own glossary, its own uh, terms, its own definitions that you at least have to be conversant with before we can uh, intelligently talk about some of the formation procedures. Now most and all of the terms are included in your T-34 manual. We have a glossary of terms that's on page 6, and at the back of the manual, starting around page um, 17 and through 19 are a list of all the formation hand signals. These are all definitions that you must know and terms to be familiar with and all hand signals that you will be tested on when you take your formation check ride. Obviously everyone has to understand and know the same and be conversant with the same signals. Uh, there is no place in formation for misunderstanding or misunderstood signals. Now I'm not going to cover all of the signals here. You're going to see them demonstrated in the videotape which will uh, uh, show you how they're used and applied, but we'd like to cover some of them where there might be some ambiguity or where you have some question as to how they're utilized. I also want to take a little time to talk about radio discipline. A good formation will require minimum chatter on the radar, uh, radio. Can't say enough about this. 
A good formation is a quiet formation. Now, all military flying, if it involved combat, was done with radio silence. Everything was done with hand signals. If it was at night, it was done with flashlight. Everything in formation, anything that's in this book, could, could be communicated to you with a hand signal or with movement of the aircraft. Obviously, with, uh, when there isn't a lot of radio chatter, we're not at war, there is nothing wrong with talking on the radio. And, nothing, and it sometimes would uh, result in less confusion. However, again, I would strongly stress that a good formation requires minimum chatter on the radio. One of the problems you're going to have is you're going to go to Oshkosh or a big air show, you're going to hear all sorts of flights on the radio, chattering away, you can't get a word in edgewise. We only have certain frequencies that we can use for plane to plane as, as civilian pilots. We just can't go off on center frequency and carry on a conversation. So it behooves you early in your formation training to understand the needs and the importance of good radio discipline. Now, in demonstrating uh, um, radio discipline, one of the things that results in the most confusion is uh, not using a proper call sign and everyone getting, not getting on the right frequency. So I'd like to go around the room and demonstrate one area that I find causes more problems and it sounds so basic and that's getting everyone up and checked in on the same frequency. Now, the, uh, we have hand signals for radio frequencies and of course we can give them verbally. Before we go out to fly, it's essential that a flight be completely briefed. Uh, we'll talk some about that as we talk about each section, but before any flying uh, would occur, we would have briefed the flight. Each member of the flight would have filled out a briefing card and we would have listed the frequencies we were going to use. We would cover the frequency we were going to check in when we all strapped in our airplanes. We'll assume we've done all that. And we pre-briefed that the flight after startup will check in on, say, for example, 122.8, Unicom. So I would call for the flight and you always use your call sign. You don't just say check in or uh, each flight would have a call sign and for good reason. If there are multiple flights in the air, you want to know that the blue two is on, not red two or somebody else. So we'll assume for uh, a point of reference that, uh, uh, that we're called COG flight. That's what our group is called out here on the West Coast. So we'll say that today we're COG flight and I'm COG lead. At the appropriate time, pre-brief time, and on the frequency, I would say COG flight check. And then I would expect from each member of the flight a nice crisp, crisp check in, two, three, four. And let's just do it like it was, uh, like we really were a flight of airplanes. I'd say COG flight check. Two, three, four. Right, nice and crisp. And uh, of course the old saw that you may have heard in formation flying, uh, you'd be brief that uh, all I want to hear out of you, Brian, for the entire flight is uh, two or lead you're on fire. Other than that, I don't want to hear anything out of you. I want radio silence. Um, so that would be the call in to check in. Now I know all members of my flight are up. If it had gone around and I had heard two, long pause, and three's not up and four, well, I know I got to find out where three is. Maybe I have to use a hand signal and reach him on the ground and get him up on the right frequency. Maybe he has a radio problem. Maybe his headset doesn't work. But we want to clear that all up before we go. Now we're all on the same frequency. It's time to roll the flight and we want to get the flight over to tower frequency. Now here is where you need to pay attention. I would say then COG flight, let's go uh, Sacramento Tower on 118.7. Two, three, four. Okay, it's very important that we do this. That means every member of the flight has acknowledged and heard the next frequency we're going to. They don't just make us, they don't just go to that frequency without letting me know they've heard it. Now I would wait and pause a fair amount of time to allow them to reach down, channelize their radios to the new frequency. Now I want to make sure they all made the right, that they didn't transpose a number, that they're all up on the right frequency. So. After a 10 second pause or so, I'll call for another check-in. I'll say, COG flight check. Two, three, four. Okay, we're all up and ready to go. That sounds simple. I guarantee you, your first several flights in formation, you're gonna lose members. Somebody will be off on a wrong frequency, copy the wrong one down or whatever. And if, it, if you wanna th see things get wild in the air, that's have one member of your flight on another frequency and not know that he switched ahead and didn't acknowledge or switched to the wrong frequency or had radio failure. So radio discipline and radio check-in is very, very important and will save you a lot of grief in flight. Since we're talking about uh, radio, let's give a couple of the hand signals that go along with it. Radios do fail, not that often these days, but if they do, the signal for radio failure is your hand in front of your face. This means I can't transmit. I can still hear you, can't transmit. If I have a receiver failure, I put my hand in by my ear, meaning I have no receiver. And therefore, we could, I could either give the lead to somebody else in the flight whose radio was working, or the flight would know that their lead couldn't hear but could talk or whatever and uh, can communi communicate the problem. Now let's say also, for example, that I hadn't, uh, uh, you missed the frequency change and uh, I told the flight to go to 118.7 and two of the men did and the number four man heard the wrong frequency and he went to um, uh, 125.6 or something. I don't know where he is. I got to find him. Well, you do it with a hand signal. You tap the side of your ear, which means, uh, you know, radio frequency coming up and then you give him the frequency and I would look at him I would top my head and I would go to one, twenty, 
five, seven. I could get that guy up on whatever frequency I wanted. So the numbers are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You can give the frequencies that way with, with hand signals. So if you've lost a man on the radio, you can use your hands way up in the canopy here so you can clearly see them, get the man up on the right frequency. Okay, hand signals. Uh, all the hand signals are covered in your book. Uh, I'd like to talk more about how do you give these hand signals. A little bit about formation discipline. Much of what you do in flight will be based on hand signals, not radio signals. Position changes, uh, crossovers, in trail, all of these things are done with signals, not on the radio. When you do them, when you give a signal, one of the things you have to remember in formation is everything must be done slowly as a lead, and the signal must be well up in the canopy where they can see it. If you give a little signal that's down here that's not clearly seen, uh, if the wingman is flying in a position where he's stacked too low or he can't see your head or he's not looking at you like he should be, he's going to miss a signal. So if you give a signal, you give it up in the canopy and you hold it up there for a length of time so that all members of the flight can see it. If you're more than a two-ship flight, then as you give the signal to the number uh, three man, he must relay it down here to number four. And you have to repeat the signal over on the left side so that your wingman over on here sees the signal. It takes time. So if, if you had to give a particular signal, you want to accomplish a particular maneuver at a certain point in flight, got to give some lead time for that. Give that signal early. Give the chance to give the signal. And everyone in the flight, and this is very important, needs to acknowledge that signal with a great big head nod. Because as a flight leader, I want to be able to look back down my, uh, at my wingman, see great big shining faces and a nice big head nod that they've all understood and received the signal. At that point, then I will go ahead and execute the maneuver. For example, if I was going to put the landing gear down, I would say, landing gear down, and I would look at you. It's, and I would expect a big head nod back from you that you've received the signal. And then the signal for execution of a, of a configuration change like that would be the big head nod. That would mean you're down at that point. If I were going to put flaps down, I would say flaps. It would give time for you to, to see the signal and acknowledge it, get your hand on the flap lever. Now, and the flaps would go down. Everything has to be given slowly and deliberately. Now, there are a couple of um, uh, other definitions and a couple of hand signals I'd like to, uh, to cover because they result in some confusion. And then we'll go into the various blocks of instruction and talk about the various elements of uh, formation flying. And although up here on the board we have diagrammed a four-ship, uh, this uh, particular training film is going to be devoted to two-ship flying because we think uh, when you're learning to fly formation, you need to first learn to fly it in a two-ship and then graduate to flying four-ship formation. All the elements are the same, but the, your problems and the difficulty goes up by, uh, geometrically when you go to a four-ship from a two-ship. Okay, first off, a couple of definitions. What we have here on the board is a uh, fingertip formation. As we said earlier, it came from uh, the name of, comes from the way your hand is. Finger four, and this is strong right. The element is on the right side. You could have fingertip uh, strong left, where the element would be on the left side. It's strictly up to the leader how he wants the flight to configure. But this is fingertip formation. This is a view from the top. This is a view from the rear. Anytime we're talking about formation, a couple of basics that we want to, uh, a couple little basic points to cover. We always have wingtip clearance. And, and you never want to fly with wingtip overlap like this. You're setting yourself up for trouble. If there was turbulence or, or uh, moments uh, where you're not paying attention and you bobble around, you have a chance of hitting. Or uh, maybe uh, this guy's engine backfired or he mismanaged his fuel and the T6 forgot to select the full tank and ran it dry and you start to overrun him. And if you're stacked in the wrong position, you may have a midair. So we always fly with wingtip clearance. That's extremely important. So this is how a flight should look from on top and from behind. We also uh, are always stacked down, as you see it like this. We never stack level. We never stack high. The flight is always stacked down, reference the, uh, uh, the lead aircraft. This is fingertip. Another formation that we have is echelon. And this is echelon formation. We'll talk later about how we get in this configuration, but this is a flight that is a sort of a parade formation. This is a formation that would be used when you arrive over the airport to break up the flight. This is a very non-maneuverable formation. The echelon is always stepped down. The thing you have to remember about an echelon is like a battleship. It's an extremely unmaneuverable formation, and the only way that this formation can turn is to the left. You always turn away from the echelon. This flight would never turn to the right into the flight. Turning to the, uh, the left uh, will, be, will present no problem, but turning to the right would cause these men to have to 
swing or rotate way down, it would be a very uncomfortable maneuver. We don't do that. So uh, in an echelon, the only time a flight would be in this position uh, in an echelon would be for an overhead pattern for a, a landing, for a breakup and landing. Other formations that we have are in trail, where the uh, airplanes are positioned behind each other. And we have two types, close trail and extended trail. But obviously, close trail results in a flight that looks like this. Once again, all members of the flight are, they have nose tail clearance and they're stacked down. So they would be one behind the other and stacked down. It's extremely important that you don't stack high. Obviously, you don't want to overrun the guy ahead of you. And if there was any engine problem with the engine plane ahead of you, you're just going to slide under him. So always, again, we're preserving the wing tail, uh, wing tip and nose tail clearance at all times in any of the formations. One of the most important things that uh, you should accomplish before any formation flight is proper briefing. Uh, I would strongly recommend that uh, if you fly or are associated with people who uh, fly formation and, and they don't brief, it doesn't mean it has to be a long or uh, drawn out briefing. If you don't have a thorough briefing, no brief, no fly. There's a, a many essential elements, a uh, number of them that need to be covered before you can go out and fly in formation. Uh, your uh, packet that came with your video uh, has a, a good uh, briefing guide that we would hope you would utilize where you can list the, uh, the different members in your flight, the, the, what you hope to accomplish, the different maneuvers on that particular mission. And one of the things that should be highlighted that should be covered on every flight are emergency procedures. Uh, there are certain emergencies that, that could come up in, that are particular to formation flying uh, that should be covered on every flight and every air show, every place you go, you should have an emergency briefing. Uh, a couple of them that are particular to formation flying uh, would be uh, boarded takeoffs, and this will be covered when we talk about takeoffs. Uh, it's very important that this be covered and that you know how to handle an aboard on the runway of any man within your flight. Second thing that would be uh, particular to uh, formation flying would be a potential mid-air. Now, we talked about the responsibilities of the lead aircraft. His job is to scan the sky around him uh, to look for other traffic. He's your eyes and ears, but just because you're flying on the wing doesn't mean you can't sky, uh, scan the sky also. Positioned on his right wing, you can look through the lead aircraft and scan this portion of the sky and call out significant traffic to your lead. You should be able to do that. Uh, once you get your basic skills in formation, you'll find that you can maintain position without concentrating 100% on the lead. Maybe 95% on him, but you move your head around. When we're, in, when we're discussing this or a potential midair, let's say that lead or the wingman spotted something that was a potential midair, not just distracting traffic. The call would be cog flight, break left, or cog flight, break right. You never, ever a practice uh, an emergency break in flight except if it's a real thing. This is a save-your-tail maneuver. So if there's a potential mid-air. If you don't make an immediate move, you're going to hit somebody. Your, your, your call should be cog flight, break left. Both members of the flight would roll into 90 degrees of bank and pull as hard as they could. If the lead didn't follow it, you're going to hit them. You know, it's right now, get out of there. You're not trying to maintain position anymore. It's a save-your-tail. Or cog flight, break right, which means the wingman just goes belly up and wham pulls as hard as he can. Uh, you have a potential mid-air within the flight, but we figure that that's less serious than this plane immediately ahead of you are going to hit. So we don't practice that. But if you ever hear that and you're in a flight and a guy says your call sign, break right or left, max G's you can pull and turn in that direction. Save your tail. 
The third thing particular to formation, if, in, uh, for example, that you had a bad radio, you had an emergency, we have a, a series of signals that we call HEFO signals. And the signal that I have an emergency would be like a fist on my forehead, it's given in the book, and it's kind of like woe is me is where it came from. And HEFO comes from uh, hydraulic, electrical, fuel, oxygen engine. So I can communicate to uh, the members of my flight or my wingman a particular problem I have by letting them know I have an emergency. And then the number of fingers, hydraulic, electrical, fuel, oxygen, engine. I had an engine problem, I'd hold up five fingers to signify the particular emergency I had. While we're talking about emergencies, the usual procedure in formation uh, under, for most emergencies would be the plane with emergency would take the lead. Obviously, if the number two man had an engine problem, you don't want him concentrated on flying formation. He needs to take care of his, uh, of his engine problem. In this case, the, the leader would say, uh, two, you have the lead. He'd back off, start flying off the, uh, off the wingman, rendering any assistance he could, looking up tower frequencies, calling out emergency fields if he knew where they were, maybe telling him that he had fire or smoke or an oil leak or whatever, providing whatever assistance he could. So in general, now there may be other emergencies. One I could give you would be a, a failure of an airspeed indicator. If you had no airspeed indicator, you might continue to fly the wing and land off your leader because you don't have an airspeed reference, so you use your lead's airspeed. Other than that, most emergencies, uh, the, the wingman or the man with the emergency will take or stay in the lead. The next phase of our video begins the instructional sequence of all the basic formation maneuvers. The classroom segment will present and describe station keeping, the foundation skill required to become a good formation pilot. Each classroom presentation will be followed by an interesting and informative video segment to give you the sight picture of proper position. The essence of formation flying, now that uh, we have some of the terms, safety equipment, where we've come from, a little of our history, the essence of being able to fly formation is station keeping or being able to maintain position. That's what formation is. Same day, same way, a constant position. Whether we're upside down, right side up, doing aerobatics or whatever, of maintaining our relative position to the lead aircraft. And this is called station keeping. Once you can maintain station keeping, everything else flows from this. And uh, there's a lot of uh, basic aerodynamics and, and uh, uh, f laws of physics that are going on here every time a power change is made or a turn is entered. So we're going to try to discuss those with you along with some of the, uh, the basic formation terms as they apply to a flight of two. So we said we're going to train as a flight of two. We're, we're going to worry about four ship flying later. And a flight of two, of course, is made up of a lead and a wingman. It's called an element. The, uh, the basic formation is what we call fingertip formation. Uh, fingertip is what you see here, and a fingertip turn, when we enter a turn or, or, or maneuver, the plane maintains its same relative position on the wing. This is called a fingertip turn. Okay? 
Another term that we've used is echelon. We showed you an echelon formation where the flight was in echelon to the right or echelon to the left. An echelon turn is made in the same plane. So if we had a flight of four echelon to the right, that turn would be made like this, as opposed to a fingertip turn, which the plane would maintain its same relative position on the other wing. Most of the turns, turns and stuff that, uh, maneuvers that you're going to uh, uh, accomplish will be in fingertip turns. All right. First thing, of course, is being able to fly straight and level. That's the first thing you learn when you fly, uh, learn to fly, and this is the first thing you learn when you fly formation. That's to maintain your position relative to the lead aircraft. As we said, the basic uh, position, it always has wingtip clearance. It's always stacked down. You never, ever get ahead of your lead airplane. That's a bad place to be. You're flying back over your shoulder. You never stack high on the lead airplane so that you're looking down at him. This is very dangerous. If you were flying stacked high on your leader and he turned to the right, you're immediately going to be blind. You're going to go belly up to him. So your position is always stacked down. So knowing what the proper position is is important. Wingtip clearance, stacked down. Now a debate that you'll get into, and we, won't, uh, we don't claim to have the last uh, or definitive answer on it, and whether you're referring to the T-34 manual, each of the different groups of warbirds has what they consider to be the best formation position to maintain. And this is how far back, what kind of line is the number two man on? Uh, a 30 degree line back from the lead or further back in a 45 degree line where you're almost have nose tail clearance. Now, this might offer a greater degree of safety. However, you'll find that if you fly this position, we have found at least with the T-28s with the, the greater weight and inertia, it's a lot easier to fly a wing position that's on about a 30 degree line, a little bit further forward. It's not worth arguing about. Whichever one your group or, or your flight leader wants to brief, that's fine. What's important is that everyone in the flight fly on that same 30 or 45 degree line. We feel that flying farther forward gives you a better match in power. You're closer to the same plane and a turn into and away from. It's an easier position to maintain. It gives up a little safety in that you don't have nose tail clearance, but if you're in the proper wingtip stack down position, uh, you're not really giving up much. All right, let's talk about the straight and level. Well, all of the controls in the airplane function just the same when you're in formation. If you're uh, a little bit too low, what do you have to do to come up? Well, if you pull a, just pull the stick back, you're also going to fall back because your plane will slide or fall to the rear because it's going to slow down as you pull back. So if you wanted to come up in formation and you were too low, you're going to have to add a little power because you're actually be climbing. You're going to raise the nose and fly forward. And it's all a coordinated maneuver. You don't, everything that you see, everything that you've been taught in flying, it's in your bones and, and uh, uh, will be amplified in formation. Every little move you make, every little power change, well, uh, you'll see a corresponding relative movement with the other airplane. It must be countered. So you just don't make a power change. You don't just move the stick. They're all done in harmony to accomplish any maneuver. Even though it seems very fluid when you watch somebody fly in formation, all of the basic physics and geometry are going on. So if you're too, uh, if you're too uh, high on, on the plane, on your wingman, you want to go down, obviously you push the stick down, and you'll pull off a little power because as soon as you lower the nose, you'll pick up some speed. Just a little speed, but ever so slight. And as you start down, you'll start to overrun the uh, lead aircraft. So it will require that you lower the nose, throttle back slightly to move down. Up and down is pretty easy to maintain. We're not talking uh, much movement here. Fore and aft is where you'll get into more problem. And fore and aft is speed, and that's controlled with a throttle. So if you had fallen behind, and, and in, in formation terms, we call that being sucked, you need power. And you add power to move forward. And what happens when you add power? plane wants to go up also. So as you add power, you'll notice it'll take a subtle forward pressure on the stick to keep the plane from, uh, from just climbing because you want to go forward. So one of the things you'll notice, you'll add power, but nothing's going to happen. And I don't care if you're flying a P-51 or a T-28 or a T-34, whatever, you never have enough power. Uh, your planes are, uh, are equal, your engines are equal. It takes a lot of power, a, a, lot of, a great power addition and a lot of power off to affect the speed change. These airplanes have a lot of momentum, a lot of inertia. So if you've fallen behind and you make no correction until you've really fallen behind, it's going to take a big application of power to stop that rearward movement, stabilize your speed, and then to accelerate some. And because of the inertia and mass, this will be slow. You'll have added a slug of power. Now your plane starts to move forward slowly and then increasing. About here, you have to make a power reduction. If you don't, the inertia and the extra speed you have will just continue and you'll start running by your leader. 
Now it takes a great big power reduction to stop the forward motion, stabilize and move back. And the big seesaw movement begins. Then you slide back, and back in with the power. So obviously you want to make smooth and rapid, quick power adjustments so that as soon as you see a relative change to the lead airplane, you stop it, add some power to get back where you are. And formation should be stressed as a series of uh, small and rapid. You're never in formation. You're always making corrections to get back in formation. It's dynamic. It's changing all the time. Formation is nothing but a series of corrections to maintain that position. And the smaller you can keep those corrections, the better your formation flying will be. The quicker that you recognize that you're too high, too low, and apply the proper correction, the better you'll be able to maintain your station keeping. Obviously, too, it's disconcerting to the lead to have a wingman out there that's making radical corrections, that's pumping the stick forward or pulling it back and, and bouncing around. You've increased the chances for a wingtip overlap and, and hitting. It's very disconcerting to a lead airplane to see a wingman out here out of the corner of his eyes flailing around. So these corrections should be smooth and positive. And, I can't, and you don't have to baby the airplane. I had an instructor uh, when I was in the Air Force and I was making these little tiny gentle corrections and always way behind the airplane. And he said, don't be afraid to move the stick and to make corrections. And uh, he put this, this happened to be an F-100, a very maneuverable airplane, put it in tight formation, went right up next to the other airplane in very tight fingertip position, and took that stick and stirred it around the cockpit as fast as he could move it. And that airplane just sat there and burbled. It was moving, but it never changed position. And he said, don't be afraid to move the stick. Make those corrections. And, I, and it taught me something. You can make a lot of quick and fast corrections. The airplane hardly moves. But the sooner you see them, the better your station keeping will be. Um, now, once you've learned to maintain the straight and level position, which is a combination of pitch and power, and obviously your fuselages are matched. You have to be trimmed. The ball must be in trim. If you're flying in a slip or a skid, or you've got a leader that's flying uh, with a skid or a slip, you're going to be trying to match fuselages, you're going to have a problem. You, you have to be parallel, same bank angle. The T-28 is a good example. The T-28 has a lot of dihedral. If you parallel wings with the 28, you'll be sitting out here on the wing looking down at the leader because his wing slopes up, and if you parallel wings, you're up like this. So you have to be able to visualize that dihedral and, and, and fly parallel, both with your wings and with your fuselage, to maintain good, uh, good formation. Um, another thing that we have to talk about when we're talking basic formation and, and uh, uh, station keeping, and this is addressed to the person that's leading you. You fly by yourself, remember, uh, you can do anything you want. You can go to full power, you can go to idle power, you can do anything, and you can do things rapidly. But now when you have a man on your wing, you can never go to full power, never go to idle power. Your throttle regime that you can operate in is much restricted because the planes are never perfectly matched. So that if takeoff power in your airplane is 50 inches, then maybe on takeoff you're going to have to use 45 inches to give your, uh, uh, your wingman a power advantage. You can never go to idle because if you were flying along and you went idle, and your plane was, uh, the wingman's plane was cleaner than yours, he's going to go right on by you. All he can do is go to idle. So you always have to give him a, a minimum and a maximum power advantage. So the lead airplane is operating in a smaller envelope, and that's very important to remember. And if you want a formation to look good, give your wingman lots of power. Don't run around at high cruise or at max power. You operate well within your performance and power envelope, and then your, lead, your wingman will have plenty of power to play with. And once you go to a four-ship, you got to think of this number four man way out here who needs even more power. So you operate in a much more restricted envelope, the more airplanes that you're dealing with. So that's straight and level. And, and you should do this and practice this. It's not as easy as it sounds, and it may take hours. But once you're comfortable and can maintain that position comfortably, should also stress that uh, uh, the lead's responsibility, of course, he's in charge of everything. He's scanning the sky. You don't want to fly with a lead that's looking back over his shoulder at you all the time. Um, He's, he's, you're, he's looking out for other airplanes in the flight, uh, and his eyes should be directed forward. That also stresses the position of a wingman being in a good position. If the wingman's up here where he ought to be, the leader can see him out of the corner of his eye. He can see that he's there. You insist on flying back here, kind of sucked and too far back. For the lead to see how you're doing, he has to completely turn around to see you. I don't think that's smart. I think the, the wingman should be positioned far enough forward so he's easily visible to the, uh, to the lead aircraft. Okay, now we're going to migrate on and talk about uh, uh, turns. Now we get into a little more complicated geometry. We're going to turn to the left. And this is going to be a fingertip turn to the left. Remember, we maintain the same relative position on the airplane in the turn. Well, the steeper we turn, or bank, it means that not only are you going to turn, but you're going to climb, right? And if you're on the outside of the turn, uh, you're also going to be around the outside of the circle. So you're going to have to go faster, just like a car on the outside of the, the racetrack or the runner. 
So to maintain this position, you're going to have to climb and add power when the, when the leader turns away from you. And it will be, uh, it will be uh, instantly recognizable. And if you don't make the, the uh, required power adjustment, you're immediately going to fall behind or the typical air is being sucked in a turn away from you. It takes a lot of power. The steeper he turns, the tighter he turns, the more power it will take to maintain that position. The key to making a good turn is as soon as you see your leader rolling into that turn, you immediately match his bank angle and come in with the power. Before you even see the relative movement start, and it's going to start, you anticipate and add power. So as soon as you see the turn away from you, start in with the power. All right, when he rolls out of the turn, what's going to happen? He's going to bank into you. You're going to actually go downhill, and you're going to have to reduce power as you roll out of that turn. So a lot's happening, and the lead should perform this very smoothly. It can be relatively rapid, but it has to be smooth. It, you don't have to... You don't have, you're not walking on eggshells. You can make a reasonably fast turn or a steep bank, but you lead it by moving into it smoothly. You don't jerk it into a bank. Your wingman won't follow. But you can, once you get the turn going, you can increase the rate. That's a turn away. Let's talk about a turn into the wingman. When you turn into him, immediately the wingman is going to be on the inside of the circle, and he's going to have to move down, which means he'll push the stick forward and pull the power off. And, of course, the tendency in a turn into you is to overshoot because if you don't make the required power reduction, you're going to start to overrun your leader. That's not where you want to be. It is very uncomfortable as a wingman to be flying back over your shoulder, to be overshooting your lead. So just as a turn away required an addition of power, a turn into you to match his speed and so on will require a reduction of power. So that's the uh, station keeping and the turn to the left and the right. The only other thing that, uh, and we talked about um, falling behind, about being sucked, talked about matching access, uh, axis. We also just want to mention briefly the echelon turn because that's the other type of, uh, uh, of turn uh, that you encounter. And this is usually uh, restricted to when you have a flight of four, but we mentioned the echelon turn is when you turn in the same plane like this. And that would be the echelon turn. You're not maintaining the position up on the wing. You don't climb as much. You're looking at the belly of the aircraft. And this turn, this type of turn is only made away from you, never into you. An echelon turn, your references are now different. And uh, uh, it, it will still require power because you'll be on the outside of the turn, but you don't have the climb to maintain this position up on his wing. So that's an echelon turn versus a fingertip turn. Now we've talked about station keeping and the ability to maintain your position in the flight. Obviously, uh, what we haven't mentioned is, how do I tell I'm in position? Well, you drive a car in the freeway and you're able to maintain a couple lengths behind or drive along next to another car, and you do that by lining up two points on the airplane. So to maintain this position, uh, you, you end up finding two points, whether it's an aileron hinge in the pilot's helmet or a tail skid in the opposite aileron. You find two points, like lining up a gun or a sight, to maintain that position and uh, two reference points on the airplane. And once you've found them, It'll be relatively uh, evident to you when you've moved too far back or too far forward because the relative alignment of those two points will change. Same thing if you stack too high in a flight, you're going to start seeing the top of his wing. If you stack too low, all you're going to see is the bottom of his airplane. So you'll pick out references uh, that will allow you to maintain that constant position, and it's essential that you do so that you can easily perceive a change. So uh, with that introduction to some of the terms in the position, we think we can best show this to you by uh, referring to the video and showing what it looks like being in the proper position in turns and in straight and level. The essence of formation flying is the ability to maintain a fixed position relative to the lead aircraft. This task is called station keeping. Regardless of the type of aircraft, civilian or military, the wingman should maintain proper position by identifying and lining up two or more reference points on the lead aircraft. 
These reference points form the basis of angle off and aircraft separation. The position is called parade position. Safety dictates that clearance must exist in at least two planes. There should always be separation in the vertical plane and the horizontal plane. At least two feet of wingtip spacing must be maintained at all times. The high point forward on the wingman's aircraft should be at least 10 feet below the lead aircraft's lower fuselage line. In most cases, this is the wingman's propeller arc. These two planes of clearance provide a margin of safety in the event of wingman overrun. Although two or more reference points have been selected, the wingman should not fixate but maintain a balanced total view of the leader's aircraft. Station keeping requires total concentration. With practice, this concentration will come more naturally. Occasionally monitoring of in engine instruments and radio frequency changes must be accomplished while maintaining position. In rough air or while learning your formation skills, you may want to spread the formation to change radio frequencies. Keep your aircraft in trim. The air mass surrounding your leader's aircraft is disturbed and not perfectly stable. This will become apparent to you by a requirement of trim change depending on which wing you fly or your position relative to your leader. Trim settings will usually be different than those of single ship flight. To effectively demonstrate what station keeping should look like, this film segment will show in position and out of position sequences. Each out of position will be followed by the proper control input and corrective action required to return to proper position from the perspective of the wingman. You are now looking at a sight picture of in position. We are providing an example of two lineup points which might be used to maintain position. To maintain position, you must maintain concentration. Going high or stack up position while station keeping is the result of not matching your leader's pitch attitude. Of the two positions, high or low, the high position is the most dangerous. The wingman in a stack up position is more likely to lose sight of his leader and be the cause of a potential conflict. You can recognize your stack up position by observing how much more of your leader's upper wing surface is visible. Also, your reference points will no longer be lined up. This view is a demonstration of a significant out of position condition. As a wingman, you must make prompt control corrections prior to reaching this condition.
To return to proper vertical position, you must use slight down elevator. Be smooth and do not over control. As you apply down elevator, your aircraft will accelerate. To compensate for this acceleration, reduce power. When back in proper station keeping position, reset power, match your leader's pitch attitude, and maintain your concentration. When you lose concentration, your position will change. Going low while station keeping is the result of not matching your leader's pitch attitude. You can recognize a station keeping low position by observing how much more of your leader's lower wing surface is visible. Also, your reference points will no longer be lined up. To return to proper vertical position, you must use up elevator. Adding up elevator will cause your aircraft to decelerate. To compensate for the deceleration, add power. When in position, reset power, match your leader's pitch attitude, and maintain your concentration. Too much lateral separation while at station keeping is termed wide. Watch this sight picture change and give visual clues on your position. The cause of going wide is when the leader and the wingman's aircraft have divergent heading or angle of bank. You can recognize a wide condition by the smaller relative size of your leader's aircraft. To correct a wide condition, the wingman must create a very slight converging heading towards his leader. This convergence will establish a closure rate. When the wingman approaches the proper station keeping position, a slight turn away from the leader will then align his fuselage line parallel to the leader. When in position, match your leader's aircraft movements precisely and promptly to maintain your position.
To maintain station keeping position, the wingman's aircraft fuselage line must be parallel to the leader. Also, the wingman's angle of bank must equal the leader's angle of bank. The opposite of wide is wing overlap. Of the two out of position conditions, wing overlap is the most dangerous. The cause of wing overlap is the failure of the wingman to detect and correct for a converging flight path with his leader. A converging flight path is caused by a mismatch between the wingman and his leader's fuselage line or different angles of bank. Proper separation is the single most important formation flight responsibility of the wingman. Concentration and matching the leader's flight path axis will prevent this wing overlap condition. As the wingman moves out of position, aircraft relative size will always change. To correct a wing overlap condition requires the wingman to turn away from his leader on a slight divergent heading. Again, your sight picture will change. Once separation is regained and proper position established, match your leader's flight path axis. Adjust power as necessary to maintain position. Concentrate on this sight picture. Correct position requires you to have the correct sight picture. Check your two lineup points periodically, but do not fixate on them. The two terms used to describe incorrect fore and aft position of the wingman relative to his leader is acute for too far forward and sucked for too far aft. Each flying group dictates which angle off best suits the type of aircraft in use. Shown in this film is a 30 degree angle off which is used by the T-28 flying group. While at station keeping with the correct step down and angle off, moving to the acute position will involve obvious changes in your total sight picture. The first visual clue for the wingman when moving out of position will be a change in the lineup points. In this example, we are using the intersections of the horizontal and the dorsal. Notice that the intersection point is changing. Also notice more of the exhaust port is becoming visible. As you move farther forward on the bearing line and become more acute, you will lose sight of your leader completely. Of the two out of position conditions, acute or sucked, acute is the most dangerous. As a wingman, you must always keep your leader in sight. While in fingertip or echelon formation, fore and aft position is controlled by power. 
If the wingman goes acute, he has used excess power. Proper power management is critical to maintaining position and formation. Too much or too little power will cause the wingman to move out of position. Early or late power application relative to the need will also cause the same effect. Every fore or aft position change will require three separate power adjustments. One to re-establish position, two to stop relative motion, and three to maintain position. When acute, you must first reduce power and allow your aircraft to slightly decelerate to regain position. Just prior to reaching position, you must add power to stop relative motion. Because of the inertia, you will need to make a greater power change than normal. Once relative motion is stopped and your lineup points are correct, reset power to maintain position. The result of precise power application is evident in this changing sight picture. The control of relative motion by the wingman is the result of prompt recognition of position change and instant corrective action. Late or timid responses to position change will significantly increase your workload in flying formation. While in parade position, only a slight distraction can cause the wingman to move out of position. As the wingman, your concentration level must be maintained to stay in position. When you lose concentration and fail to make prompt power adjustments, your aircraft's longitudinal position relative to the leader's aircraft will change. A good leader is essential to safe and precise formation flight. Your leader must be qualified experienced, and above all, smooth and considerate. The conduct of the flight is the leader's responsibility. Your ability to concentrate will depend on the confidence you have in your leader. Do not fly in any formation unless you have confidence in all flight members. The intent of all the stop motion scenes in this film is to give the viewer a correct reference sight picture. Regardless of the type of aircraft in formation flight, such as T-34, T-6, or other military or civilian types, the relative sight picture will be the same. In other words, when the wingman is in position, his leader's aircraft will be higher, slightly forward, and there will be wingtip separation. The lineup reference points to affect this position will be unique to each aircraft and pilot, but parade position will always look the same. The opposite of an acute position is sucked. Failure to recognize and correct for aft relative motion will cause you to become sucked. Once again, watch the sight picture change. Subtle at first, and then becoming much more obvious as the wingman moves significantly out of position. Normally you would take corrective action long before this sight picture develops, but with loss of concentration, moving out of position can occur rapidly. The power required to re-establish parade position from a suck condition is significantly higher than the power to maintain position. In the sucked position, your angle off bearing will be greater than 30 degrees. Your two lineup points will no longer be visible, and the total sight picture of your leader's aircraft will change. Position changes of this magnitude should not be tolerated in formation flight. The proper corrective action to regain position from a sucked condition is to add sufficient power to accelerate. When you add power, your aircraft will tend to pitch up. 
This pitch-up will require a slight down elevator correction. When you approach the parade position, reduce power to stop the acceleration. Because of inertia, you will be required to add power again before all relative motion stops in order to maintain position. If you wait until all relative motion has stopped to reapply power, you will once again become sucked. When in position, adjust power as required to control relative motion. To maintain parade position requires concentration and constant manipulation of all flight controls available to the wingman. Rapid, small, and frequent control inputs are necessary to prevent position change. You must constantly keep checking your lineup points to prevent relative motion from occurring. The leader must be able to rely on his wingman to maintain position. The practice necessary to perfect the art of maintaining straight and level parade position is the foundation skill required to progress to more advanced maneuvers in formation flight. As a wingman, your skills must include the ability to precisely control your aircraft with very small, imperceptible corrections. As a practice maneuver, moving up and down the line is a test of these skills. Moving down the line is accomplished when the wingman gains separation from the lead aircraft on an extension of the bearing line. This involves moving down, aft, and wide. Notice the leader's aircraft appears stationary and only relative size is changing. The essence of the maneuver is the wingman's ability to slightly change heading, pitch, and power so as to cause aircraft separation to occur precisely on the bearing line. The visual clue to the wingman is no relative fore-aft movement of the leader's aircraft. Note the relative size and position of your leader's aircraft from this extended perspective. Picture, if you can, a set of crosshairs superimposed on your leader's aircraft. To proceed up the line, maintain the crosshairs in the center of your leader's aircraft during the closure. With coordinated use of all the controls and by adding power, establish a slight converging heading and proceed up the line. The diverging heading for down the line or the converging heading for up the line is very slight. The size of the heading difference between aircraft determines the speed of the maneuver. When you return to parade position, adjust power and maintain station keeping. Practicing and mastering this exercise will sharpen your visual perspective and enhance your formation flying skill. After you have become proficient at station keeping straight and level, you should progress to station keeping turns. Demonstrated will be inside turns and outside turns relative to the leader. On the inside turn, your radius of turn is less than your leader. Your position during the inside turn does not change relative to your leader. 
When the leader commences a turn into his wingman, the wingman rolls about his leader's axis. As your leader commences his turn, you must reduce power, slightly pitch down, and match his roll rate while maintaining step down and proper wing position. Parallel your leader's fuselage line and angle of bank while in the turn. Your smaller turn radius will require less power and you will be at a lower altitude during the turn. During the inside turn, no other reference is available to the wingman other than his leader's aircraft and your lineup points. Also, the appearance of your leader's aircraft floating in space, especially when no clouds exist to form a background, can cause disorientation. When your leader commences his rollout, fly about his axis. Add power and very slight pitch up at the start of the rollout to maintain position. When the turn is complete, readjust power as required to maintain parade position. Concentration and coordinated use of all controls will assure proper position is maintained. Sky conditions and time of day will sometimes have a dramatic effect on your ability to maintain position. As you commence an inside turn with the sun low on the horizon, your perspective of your leader's aircraft will change due to color and light. The net effect of these lighting changes is to occasionally cause illusions or visual discomfort. The most discomfort will be when you are directly down sun. Take precautions to anticipate this condition and change your focus point so as not to be staring into the sun. Always use your helmet visor or good sunglasses to prevent momentary sight loss as the result of direct sunlight. Formation flying is demanding, but also very rewarding and satisfying. When you choose to fly formation, you will not always have the good fortune of selecting perfect flying conditions. You must be disciplined and maintain your concentration to stay in position through periods of distraction. Flight safety demands this discipline of all flight members. A common error on the inside turn is a delay in reducing power at the commencement of the turn. This will cause the wingman to go acute and occasionally develop wing overlap. As you can see from viewing this action, the wingman has lost sight of his leader and is dangerously close to the leader's aircraft. In this view, the wingman is significantly out of position. The need for wingman step-down is obviously apparent now. Although dangerously close, collision has been averted because the wingman has maintained vertical separation. Turns into the wingman pose the greatest potential for mid-air collision. Concentration, proper step-down, and matching your leader's aircraft movements precisely will prevent this out-of-position condition from developing. To 
correct and acute position, make a power reduction. When established on the bearing line, adjust power to maintain position. If you also have wing overlap, maintain step down and adjust your heading to gain proper separation from your leader. When proper position is reached, adjust your power and match your leader's fuselage line to maintain position. Do not over control in correcting to gain separation. Small, coordinated, and decisive control inputs are required to adjust your position. Formation flying is teamwork. When all movements of the lead airplane are matched precisely by the wingman, the result is a single flying unit. As you practice and gain the skill to match your leader's aircraft movements, your confidence will grow. Let's review the inside turn once again. As your leader commences his turn into you, reduce power and pitch down. Roll about your leader's axis. Make small, continuous, coordinated control corrections and power adjustments to stay in position. Your fuselage axis should parallel your leader's aircraft. Your angle of bank should be the same. Maintain proper step down. When your leader commences a rollout, add power, pitch up, and roll about your leader's axis. When rolled out, adjust power as required to maintain position. Station keeping during outside turns and fingertip formation requires the wingman to add power, slightly pitch up, and maintain the same relative position on his leader. As wingman, your turn radius will be larger, your altitude slightly higher, and your airspeed slightly greater in the outside turn. When your leader begins his turn, you must instantly react with the proper control input to maintain position. While entering the turn, your fuselage line must be parallel to your leader's aircraft and your angle of bank must be equal to his. To prevent relative motion, the process of adding power must become instinctive. Maintaining your position in an outside fingertip turn requires you to equal your leader's angle of bank and align your fuselage line parallel to his. Converging fuselage lines or an increased angle of bank by you, the wingman, will develop a closure rate and cause you to move out of position. A natural tendency of the new wingman is to be initially uncomfortable performing an outside fingertip turn. You appear to be on a perch looking down at your leader. You may be inclined to use top rudder to control separation or offset a feeling of closure. This feeling should be rejected in favor of smooth, balanced flight with position changes accomplished in a coordinated manner. While your altitude plane is higher, you should continue to maintain step down from your leader's longitudinal axis. The result of proper step down will be a sight picture of your leader's aircraft the same as straight and level. Rolling out from an outside turn requires you to reduce power, pitch down, and roll about your leader's axis. Smooth, coordinated use of all the controls is necessary to maintain position. Common errors may include over control of the elevator or a delay in reducing power causing a porpoise or overrun condition.
Let's review the entire sequence again and watch closely as the turn commences and continues. There are no idle moments in formation flight. The workload is constant and demanding. If you fail to concentrate, you will become an unsafe member of the flight. The highest workload is when transitioning from one maneuver to another. In formation flying, the emphasis must always be on safety. To be a safe formation pilot, you must be well trained in the basics. Once the basics are learned, repeated practice sessions are essential. Ignore the urge to show off or grandstand. Do not have confidence beyond your capability. Instead, choose discipline and professionalism in your approach to formation training. Extra close formation with no wingtip clearance or step down is not professional or exciting to watch from the ground. This is contrary to popular myths espoused by the uninformed. A well balanced formation with all flight members in military position will be remembered long after the gaggles fly over. At the moment of outside turn roll-in, if you do not instinctively add power, up elevator, and roll about your leader's axis, you will become sucked. Notice the instant separation which occurs as the result of a late power application. Once again, your total sight picture has changed and your lineup points are missing. In the low to middle altitude regimes propeller aircraft routinely fly, available excess power is a luxury not normally available. Although a qualified leader is considerate, your energy level in excess of his will be minimal. To prevent being sucked, you must maintain concentration and react immediately to your leader's course changes. As you fly this wider radius on an outside turn in a sucked condition, your leader is out of normal view. As the wingman, you are also missing from the leader's normal field of view. Communication by hand signal is now all but impossible. If the leader increases his angle of bank from this point, you will be in trail, not on the wing. Effectively, you are no longer in formation. To correct a sucked condition requires you to add power and accelerate to the proper station keeping position. Remember, without the proper throttle control, inertial will cause you to overrun the position. When a closure rate has been established with excess power, you will have to reduce power just prior to reaching position, then readjust power to maintain position. In other words, three throttle adjustments for each fore and aft position change. Position change should be slow and deliberate. Fast closure rates and close formation are dangerous and never necessary. As you practice, your skill level will improve and with this improved skill will come confidence. Maintaining position on your leader's wing will become natural and instinctive. Regardless of skill level, formation flight demands of the participants total concentration, maturity, and discipline. Any formation pilot not possessing these traits will be an unsafe team member. Another type of wingman position during outside turns is called echelon. 
During the roll-in to an echelon turn, the wingman rolls about his own axis. Watch as we transition from a fingertip turn to an echelon turn. Notice the changing sight picture and observe additional sky between the leader's inboard wing and lower fuselage line. Relative position to your leader in an echelon turn is on a lower plane. Your sight picture of your leader's aircraft is different in echelon turns. This new sight picture will incorporate more of the lead aircraft underside. Visual contact between lead and wing will also be impaired. Echelon turns are normally employed in an echelon formation when used in staging for an overhead approach. A leader will never turn into the echelon. Wingman echelon position is only performed in an outside turn. An echelon turn reduces the amount of additional power required to maintain position as the result of a smaller turn radius, closer in size to the lead's aircraft radius. As the turn continues, we will change position from echelon to fingertip. Notice how the wingman smoothly maneuvers the aircraft to a higher altitude while maintaining relative position on the bearing line. Once again, notice the position changes are slow and deliberate. Coordinated flight and planning are essential ingredients necessary to accomplish formation position changes. Maintain your concentration, but always strive to be an alert and thinking wingman. During station keeping flight, always observe the following flight safety items. Always pre-brief formation flight. Fly your formation flight as briefed. Maintain your concentration. Always keep your leader in sight. Maintain proper step down at all times. Maintain wingtip clearance. Now it's time to take a break and change tapes. Tape 2 begins with a review of station keeping and questions from our class students. <laughs>